It is my privilege and joy that we can continue our Bible study in the crucible with Christ. And today we have the subtitle, Seeing the Goldsmith Face. We all know that Jesus is coming. And the Bible says, but who may abide the day of his coming? And who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire and like the fuller's soap. And he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. And he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. This is the end of the refiner's work to reflect God's righteousness, to reflect, reflect the goldsmith's face, because he's the one that wants to make us according to his image. That's why we want to look into his face so that we may become like him. And our face should reflect perfectly his image. We have seen that the impurity is something that we are born with. It's the lie in which we are born. And we need to become clean. That is, we need to come in the truth. The law of heredity, we all know it, has made us what we are. I am born by a father and by a mother. I am half of them. 50% of my spirit is my father and 50% of my body comes from my father. 50% of my spirit comes from my mother and 50% of my body comes from my mother. That's why I am the son of my father and also the son of my mother. I have the inheritance of sinful nature from both of them. Of course, there is only one sinful nature, but I get it from both of them. So I am in a total fallen nature of man in which I cannot approach God. It's impossible. I will never go to God in sinful nature. It's not possible. I only can collect my needs from my mom and from my dad and from all those around me. There is no way to connect to God through faith and trust. It's impossible. So this is the way we are born. And since there is no way to escape from this, God made a plan of salvation. The eternal Son of God added to his divinity humanity. And this is the greatest mystery of the universe, how this adding could have taken place. Now, that is not something that we can study. And it's not something that we can study the divinity of Christ. But what he is as a human is clear because it's under the law of heredity. And that law is evident to us. Jesus, as human, needs a mother and a father. The father is God. We know he was conceived through the Holy Spirit and his mother is Mary. She was the chosen one. Jesus, as a human being, had 50% of his spirit from his father and 50% of his body from his father. The same, he had 50% from the spirit from his mother and 50% of his body from his mother. That's why he was the son of God as a human and he was the son of man as a man because he was the son of of Adam, and Adam was called the man. He was human. So here it is. This is Jesus' human nature, which is no mystery in it, because it is by the law of heredity made plain. He inherits in his spirit from his father his right identity. He knows he is the father's son. And so he connects in the moment of conception. He connects through faith and trust to his father. Since this is an unconscious process, an automatism that happens that God has created so the spirit, he was by his inheritance from his father connected to God. We connect to our parents, to mother, because of the inheritance, we can only connect to my mother and to father. It's not possible. But Jesus, since he had an heredity from his father, by conception, he was connected to the father immediately. 
and he also inherited sinful nature. But he took that on him, this is the fallen nature of man, in order to eliminate it, in order to free us from it. And it's only possible through his inherited nature from his father, that he was connected to his father and could eliminate his inherited sinful nature. Now, some people present the nature of Christ because they don't know the nature of man as being identical with the nature that we all are born with. But I hope you remember the picture that I had from me. And since I don't want things to be too complex, I made two different slides for each uh, person. This is Christ and me before. I come from a human father. That's why my, from both, I have an identical inheritance that cannot make me to connect to God. Jesus took our fallen nature. He was 100% human and he had sinful nature, but he did not overcome sin in sinful nature. Or better to say, through sinful nature. Like some people present it. So like we could, through our sinful nature, overcome our sin. How can you do that? That's impossible. That's why we have read in Romans 8, 3. He came in the flesh because of this to destroy it in himself. But he could never destroy it through itself. That's impossible. It was by his inherited nature from his father that Christ overcame sin in himself. It was not by this nature that he overcame sin. Because in this nature, there is no way ever to overcome sin. No way ever. How, how can it? It would be a contradiction in itself. Lie should destroy lie. That's impossible. So let us be very clear. It was Christ's inherited nature from his Father that connected him to the Father, through which he destroyed in himself sinful nature. And on the cross, he eliminated that what is called in, in 1 Corinthians 15, the sting of death. Yes, it says, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin. Jesus eliminated the sting of death. That's why we can live. Because this thing of death is something that cannot be, how can I say, it is that that destroys our being. And it must be eliminated. If it's not eliminated, we stay in the second death. And it can only be eliminated by the battle through this inherited nature. Jesus overcame. The Father was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself by eliminating the sting of death, which is sinful nature or sin singular. And when he eliminated that which is the second death, he took it away, the sting of death. Then he died the first death in order to make out of the materials, the cleansed materials, the body and the spirit of man, to create a complete new man. At the resurrection, he is the firstborn son of God. He is God's new creation. He is the second Adam. He is the new man forever connected to God. He is our heritage. He is our righteousness. This nature, is that what called in Romans 8, 
the nature after the spirit. This is that nature. The other is the nature after the flesh. And this is the nature after the spirit. So that's why I need a new birth. I need a new nature. But for this, the first step is to recognize that I'm lost. That's why the cross is the first step of letting go of a part of self-deception and taking in by faith the inheritance prepared by God in Christ. And through this inheritance, I connect to God. It would not be enough to take this thing of death out. I must have a new life. And that I have through inheritance, not by an inheritance that is through law, but by promise, through faith. And now, after the new birth, the battle starts. You eliminate father and mother as your so-called origin, because your origin now is in God. You know that from John 1, 12 and 13, which says very plain, and I read this Bible verse again and again because uh, it's nice to review them. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. Even to them that believe on his name. So it's, we become the sons of God by faith, only by faith, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. This is our inheritance. And only through this inheritance, and it's only by this inheritance, connected to the Father, we overcome the inheritance from our parents, from Adam. Never believe that you can overcome sinful nature through your sinful nature. Almost all try that. And it never works. I need a new inheritance in order to eliminate the error in my heart. I need to become partner with God before I can do one step. Before I can do one step. This is the new birth. It is a grace of God that I can see my complete helplessness. And through faith, I take in his life. And now through his life, through the life of Jesus, that is brought to me through the Holy Spirit, I am now one with my Father. And now the battle begins. Now I need to know what happens in my heart. And only being partner with God, I can overcome the old nature. Never try it in the old nature to overcome. It's impossible. It does not work. How can you eliminate lie through lie? I mean, a lie is a lie. Two lies doesn't become truth. So we need a new inheritance. That's the new birth the need of the new birth. And through this, being one and partner with God, it's only in this co-working together that we have a chance to eliminate this. That's so important to understand because people try to fight the battle in their sinful nature, to overcome in sinful nature but this, we will see later, is the work and the result of the unwise. Um, the unwise virgins. So, without crucible, no chance to become pure. It is the goldsmith work to bring us into this crucible. The crucible comes from outside because there we get our need. The crucible brings us for a purpose to show us the inside 
on which do we depend? And depending on how we react to the crucible, we see if we are still in the lie or in the truth. So in this process, it is so important to understand the spheres of action. God has his sphere of action. He gave us our sphere of action, which he will not interfere. And he is around each individual because outside of me, the circumstances are in his hands, not in mine. In mine is only my heart, is only what I do or not do. And that's my sphere of action. And no one can interfere into that because God has given it to every individual. Now, we have enemies around us living on this earth. We have the devil with his hosts. We have the dangers in nature. And we have the people that are not so kind to us. They might get angry on us when we don't do what they expect us to do. And now we need to know that when this can approach us, they had to go first through God. So that when it comes to us, it comes from God to us and not from them. It's them that do the actions, but we know they passed God's sign. He gave it for the purpose to help me. No matter how many enemies will come, they come from God. No matter how many bad circumstances or diseases or whatever you encounter, if they come as an effect from God and they come for your best and for the best of the whole, no matter how we react to it, even when we react like Peter the wrong way, it's still benefic because we can then resolve that thing. And even that consequence is beneficial. For Jacob, it was beneficial when he got that hit on his hip. It was a remembrance for his whole life that something in him had to be killed. So whatever God brings into our life is for our best and everything is never too hard or too much. So this is basic to understand. So that in this crucible, in the situations we are, we should not go the wrong way. Because in the crucible, you can be hardened in your heart instead of being softened in your heart. It, it works in both ways. So that's why it's so important to know it is our Father who guides the circumstance. And yes, it's so hard sometimes to believe that. So hard. Because there are things in my life that I would never experience. And he brings them into my life. And I must believe that it comes from him. And then I go and say, Lord, my, I understand that by my mind, by my reason. Because that's the law and that's how it only can function. But my heart is in rebellion. My heart doesn't want to accept that as coming from you. So help me. Help me that I can do it. Because one day the battle will be over. The sting of death, the sting of the second death must be removed from my life. But it can only be removed through the new inheritance to be a son of God that connects me to the Father. And we make one party fighting the battle in our hearts, in my heart. It will be a great day when the sting of death will be taken off. And we will reflect the goldsmith face, which is the reflection of our father's face. It will be a great day. We are living at the end of time. In our lecture, we have the parable of the ten virgins. 
I think most of us know that parable. It's the parable of the last work of the people on earth before Jesus comes. And the ones have oil and the other don't have oil enough. And as the story tells, those who have oil go with the bridegroom. I read from verse 6, Matthew 25. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out, even, go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you, but go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Watch therefore, for you know neither that day nor the hour when the son, wherein the Son of God, of man, cometh. So, there are two lessons that I want to get out of this story, of this parable. The first is, when the bridegroom cry, when the cry comes at midnight that the bridegroom is coming, neither one can prepare. Either your lamp is full or it's empty. It is not possible to go and buy. Like in the parable, they buy, but it's not possible to buy and come then back because Jesus says, I don't know you. And the second is the carrot. Oil we know is the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit is a teacher. And through Him, we cooperate with God to bring out God's character. So that what makes us shine is the power of God. That is our connection to Him. And that must be perfect. We must be ready. The heart must be cleansed in order to do that work. That's why when this call comes, and this call can come at any time from now on, and those who are ready are ready, and those who are not ready are not ready. But we should not stress us because of this, because that would show again that it's align us, we should be watchful. Watchful means I take care that in all this uh, process of cleansing in the crucible, I co-work with God step by step. And then I don't need to fear anything. I don't need to fear that I won't be ready. But I must know that then we cannot watch anymore. That's why we take serious every situation in which we are. We don't play games with God. We live seriously with Him through the Holy Spirit. Now, what is the character? Or what is the character made of? And it is simple. It's the sum of all thoughts, emotions, and feelings. That's the invisible part of our character. And then all our actions make our character, which is the visible part of our character. So we have these two parts, the invisible and the visible. So the invisible are our thoughts. They process information. It's us that process information. And our thoughts will then be made, if we believe them and follow them, to actions. But the thoughts are invisible. 
Now, emotions are the reaction of the body to our unconscious thoughts. Even before they become conscious, we feel something. That's why sometimes people think emotions come before we think. No, it's a subconscious thought that makes the emotion. And also then through the emotion, I can go and see, okay, what, what was I thinking? Because we have the capacity to reflect ourselves, to go and search. And then, of course, we have the feelings and those are expressions of the body regarding its needs and wants to the spirit. When I have pain somewhere or when I have, I'm hungry or thirsty or tired, those are feelings. No one feels them with you. It's only in you that happens. So no one can have the feelings with the other. Some people say, okay, I, I feel what you feel. It's, it's not possible. Because this is the invisible part of it. Even though we might see that someone has burned his hand and we know how it feels because we had the same experience, but we still might perceive it a little bit different. That's why it's very individual. So that's what happens invisible in us. And then out of us comes words, gestures, and all our actions, deeds. So this is the sum of our character. So how can we resume what is as a result the character? Character is all what we think and do. So it's made out of our own actions. That's character. That's the character. Now, is there any character the same than the other one? No. Every character is individual. Because it is, by definition, the action of the person itself. That's why, in the parable, it's not transferable. You cannot transfer your character. It's not possible. It's not transferable. That's why the wise are not bad persons that they don't share their oil. Because they cannot transfer their actions. You see, in that day when the cry will come, I might have a friend who is from the not wise virgins. Will I be able to help him? Not at all. No. One that day it says one is taken, one is left. Because character is individual. No one can transfer it to another. You must do it yourself. That's why if... You paid attention to the explanation before. The action of salvation must be our action. Character building is my action, not Scott's action. But I need an inheritance and I need a power outside of me to build that character. To have pure thoughts, to have good emotions that come from pure thoughts. And if I have pure thoughts, all things are good. Because there is something that determines the character. And the character is determined to be in the truth. And that results into love and selflessness. That's the motivation. So the determination of the character is, who am I? Am I in the truth or not? And then if I am in the lie like I was born, then pride and selfishness comes out. Now the foolish virgins in the crucible where they came in, instead of learning and be teachable, they went against the things. That's why we must never trust our heart. Our heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. We cannot trust it. That's why when anything comes out of our lives, let us eliminate it. Let us let it go. If it's about us, you see, people want to be saved by all means. Well, then you're still in deception because it's about you. The foolish virgins are serious Christians. That is, they want to be saved. They want to do the good. They are vegans. They, are, they, they do exercise every day. They go and give books to others and they share all those things. It looks like their character is good. 
Like Nicodemus, did he have a bad character? Like Paul, before he was converted? Like uh, the rich young ruler? They were noble men. You wouldn't dare to tell them that they lost. So, because outsidely, they looked like good. Because you can outdo out from sinful nature. You can perform great things. You can do so good things outsidely while still doing them for yourself. That's why the crucible is so helpful. Because it reveals in the crisis our character. It says, both parties were taken by surprise, but one was prepared for the emergency and the other was found unprepared. A sudden and unexpected calamity, something that confronts the soul with sickness or death, will now show whether there is a real faith in the promises of God. So this is so important for us to understand. The crisis in which we are in, worldwide crisis, has shown that people love their life. And now it's not bad that when you see, okay, I came into this situation and um, you see that you still are afraid to lose your life. Then you go like Elijah because he was also caught in a sudden calamity. And out of it came out his sinful nature, his, the lie in him. But he was teachable. And God appeared to him and said, come unto me. And he walked for 40 days. There he was changed when he saw the face of the goldsmith. When he saw the face of his God. So let us co-work with him. Let us not be somehow stuck. And let us not condemn ourselves when we see that things don't go. But let us cling unto the cross and by faith get to the point of the finish line. Because when that last call will come, it will show whether the soul is sustained by grace. It will show whether they rest in Christ or not. I want to get to that finish line. Because the wise virgins have the most beautiful work to do. They have to illuminate the world with the love of God. But they won't do that under stress, so to say. The light will shine out because it is in them. They have the inheritance of the life of Christ. They live from him. And what they show to the world is the reflection of their father. It's the reflection of the goldsmith face. It's natural reflection. They will illuminate the whole world in the biggest and most difficult circumstances because they have learned that the battle is just inside, not outside. I don't need to change outside of me something. I just need to change my heart. And there we have this promise in Daniel 12, 3, which is in the same context of the last days. And they that be wise. And in German, Luther translates the teachers, not the wise. But it's about teachers because the teachers must be wise. They shall shine as the brightness of the firmament. Yes, in that last day, our lamps will shine like the brightness of the firmament. And God, and we'll have the privilege that through our lives, through our character, the world will be full of the glory of God. Because we're clean because we are His, because our faith has got to the end. And then, 
and they that turn many to righteousness. And that will be our job. The heathen will come in great numbers to take in the way of righteousness. And what will be the result of that? And they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. I want to have this inheritance. I want to shine as bright as the firmament, showing the goldsmith's face, showing my father's face in a natural way, because through his grace and his work, through the continuous work of the Holy Spirit, my spirit accumulated all that in order to now shine it out and do that great work. That will be the greatest that ever was given to human being. And what a glory and what a grace we have to be part of that. And they that turn many to righteousness shall shine as the stars forever and ever. Amen.